Good. Hello, welcome to my Ed Talk. My name is Chloe Akashiro. I'll be your host today. And today we are looking at the question of how do inclusive classroom environments lead to greater academic outcome for neurodivergent students? Uh, let me take you back to the 90s when things were a lot more funky and also very rigid uh, in the school system structure. I was a child who was struggling in school, being put in the resource room, and uh, because I had ants in my pants, I was distracting to others, and uh, teachers had a hard time keeping me uh, under control, I would say. Um, when I look at my um, grade four report card here, it says, Chloe is a happy and energetic student. She is making slow but steady progress in math, and to achieve higher marks, Chloe needs to work more quickly, be less distracted, hand in assignments, complete homework, and study for tests. We, and Chloe, and we encourage Chloe to challenge herself and apply herself academically. Looking back on these comments on my academic self during these very formative years of education, I feel sad for the little version of myself. It also makes me wonder the impact of the words that were cited over me over and over again um, as I was at this young age. When we look at a study back in 2022 by Roma Fasteren et al., it has really made me reflect on the impact that I feel like these words had on me. The study found that giving praise and helpful comments, positive reinforcement, was linked to 24.7% of students' motivation to learn. This means that when students were praised or received helpful comments, almost a quarter of their motivation to learn came from that. In fact, it accounted for 92.8% of their motivation. This means that almost all of students' motivations to learn was influenced by the feedback they received on their schoolwork. The words I had heard repeatedly at a young age followed me through my academic history from elementary all the way to post-secondary. The journey through this time was marked by academic challenges that left me feeling excluded and frustrated. And it was such a great effort to get me motivated to do anything. And when I finally did do something, I would still receive a C minus mark and kind of put me back down to where I started from in the beginning. I felt less motivated to try again and I was stuck in the cycle of perceived failure and I had really had a lack of care to try harder. I struggled to understand what was wrong with me, why was it so difficult for me to grasp most school related concepts. Slide. Here we can find in my journal I had written if, if I could have one wish it would be no school. Can you imagine at such a young age, I just had such a lack of motivation to even keep on going to school, trying harder. I just felt like it was too challenging and too boring, and I was stuck in the cycle of helplessness. When I was placed in the resource room, it felt like a constant reminder of my shortcomings. While my friends thrived in a regular classroom, I found myself segregated, labeled as different, and less capable. This sense of learned helplessness became a constant companion, shaping my perception of myself and my abilities. But as I continue to unpack these notions and uh, navigate this feeling of loneliness that is triggered when I'm doing assignments like this, I see that I was maybe only looking at the other kids that were placed on a pedestal for you know, academic greatness, but I actually wasn't looking at probably the majority of the classmates that were sitting right beside me who were struggling just as much, if not more, but doing it so quietly that I didn't notice. Um, in this next slide, a study is done in 2022 by Dana Rolfelder and Stefan Kalakwa speaks on the commonality of learned helplessness and its impact on learning. The study showed that school belonging and exclusion moderated the development of, adol development of adolescent learned helplessness, helplessness from one point to another. School belonging and exclusion together accounted for 24.7% of variation in learned helplessness suggesting a significant impact on students' feelings of helplessness, feelings of ability, and ultimately academic outcome. I believe in these formative years of my life when these words were spoken over me by my educators and then by my parents that it had a lasting impact on me and the way that I perceived that I was dumb, slow, different from others. This learned helplessness mix, mixed with sheer stubborn will did not serve me well in school. While I was busy in social settings in high school, like being vice president of student council, co-captain of the senior girls volleyball team, peer mentor, 
um, I, was, I had this reputation with the school of this happy-go-lucky kid with a poor attitude towards academics. Um, on multiple occasions, um, some teachers found this funny, they liked me for who I was, and then other teachers really did take it personally. Um, I had an English teacher who would take me out in the hallway or in front of the classmates and point to me and be like, why are you not smart like other Yakushiros? All my other family members attended his AP English classes. I had another teacher who told me that I was too busy saving the whales to care about um, my academic outcome in his class, that I was wasting his time and my time by participating in too many after-school activities and not focusing on my academics. But at this time in high school, I was really comfortable putting all my efforts into extracurricular activities, residing that my brain was not like others, and so I just shrugged it off and kept on doing what I had always done. When I graduated from high school, I took a gap year and went to India and worked at an NGO. And when I came back to face the real, real world, I had made up my mind that I was not going to attain my dream of becoming a high school counselor because I was not smart enough to do so. But I still wanted to serve others, practice human connection and empathy because that's what I knew my strength was. So instead, I decided to enroll myself in a hands-on paramedic program in a post-secondary post institution in BC. It was the hardest I have ever worked uh, at academics, but I was still drowning. At one of the lowest points in, in, in my time there, we were uh, sitting at a classroom-wide debriefing on what had gone wrong in our practical examinations. I was sitting there doodling to try and stay focused like I normally do, and I felt something hit me. And I looked up, and you know the panel of the teachers are sitting there, and I smiled at this, the instructor who was speaking, um, but he just looked confused. I looked next to him, and there was Brian sitting there. And he was super red in the face and visibly agitated. And then I realized that he had thrown something at me because I wasn't paying attention. He said, this is your last chance to pay attention before you get punted out of the classroom. And uh, yeah, that was a really horrible moment for me. Um, although the instructor did get suspended for his actions, it still left me feeling lower than before, more outcasted, and just not that I felt, left me feeling like I didn't fit in with the average student. The program was very competitive and was focused on absorbing large amounts of medical knowledge through lectures and PowerPoints. It was a three strikes and you're out rule. And I failed out of the program on my last set of practical exams and had to re-enter into the troop after me. Um, once again here, I was liked by some instructors for my personality and rejected by others for, not, for my lack of ability to focus and produce stronger grades. Reflecting on the way it made me feel as an outcast or not belonging to the program by some teachers, I felt strongly that it was linked to my de decrease in confidence, mental health, and ultimately the belief that I could not succeed as a paramedic. This relates to a study done in 2011 by Joseph P. Allen that states in secondary schools, one of the largest potential mediators of academic outcomes is the extent to which students are motivated and engaged by their interactions with their teachers. Students report interactions with teachers to be critical to their success, and yet often report very poor quality relationships. Student motiva motivation in school begins to decline as early as age 11. And by entry into high school, more than half of students from all types of schools report that they di do not take their studies seriously. Disengagement in the classroom is related to low academic achievement, disruptive and uncooperative behavior, missed instructional time, and ultimately school failure. After failing out of the program, I came back a bit more organized. I was able to get my documentations in order for accommodations as a neurodivergent student and was able to have extra time for my exams, do it in a separate room, have noise canceling headphones. And I do actually really feel like that helped. Um, the second time through, I was able to um, use this inclusive environment to my advantage. And I made it through the rest of the program without using up any more of my strikes. After I graduated from the program, I felt very relieved to make it out alive, and I was grateful to graduate, but I also left the place feeling like a little part of me died in there. The experience I had there left me feeling like I offered very little as a paramedic, and ultimately left me feeling defeated by my inability to learn the same way as others, and at the same pace. Due to this awful educational experience, I vowed to myself that I would never go back to school, so I would not have to live through academic failure again and put my family through the shame of failure. Fast forward to eight years later, I have returned to my greatest fear, school. I told myself I have the return to school as a mature student and have outgrown my stupidity and may be able to fare better. 
Upon my return, I have been shocked at the changes the school has made. For the first time in my life, I feel worthy to be in school. My mind has been open to a new world of inclusive education and being shown my worth as a student is no longer tied to stressful multiple choice exams or whether or not I can fit in with the average student. I entered school last semester incredibly vulnerable and afraid of failure. And then I was greeted by some amazing instructors and have been introduced to the likes of Shelley Moore, who has changed my view of education and myself as a student forever. The learning environment these people have created for me has helped me become the best version of my academic self yet, and it's no mystery why. When we look at a study in 2017 exploring how classrooms that integrated positive youth development, PYD principles, which emphasized nurturing students, uh, student strengths, fostering supportive environments, and promoting constructive interactions, contribute significantly to learning atmosphere. These programs not only enhance positive outcomes such as skills, attitudes, academic performance, but also serve as protective factors against potential challenges like behavioral issues, substance use. The study further, uh, further suggests that by prioritizing the enhancement of individual strengths, creating supportive learning environments, and facilitating positive environments and interactions, that these initiatives can yield long-term benefits. These include improvements in future social relationships, higher rates of high school graduation and college attendance, and reduction in negative outcomes such as arrests, clinical disorders, and this is persisting up to 18 years post-intervention of this positive interaction at schools. For me, the classroom that was ground zero for an inclusive environment was with one of our instructors who I shall name Alex. He was so supportive of all learning abilities and it's helped me realize my strengths and change the way the trajectory of that my education will lead me. And I caught the Shelley Moore crush through him. Despite the additional workload on his part, he allowed me to do adaptive assignments to show, showcase my grasp of, of course material. And his supportiveness made me feel secure in approaching him to request the adaptive assignment option. Whereas previously, I probably wouldn't have asked. I probably felt too dumb or embarrassed. I didn't want to be set aside, excluded, segregated, etc. I just wanted to feel like a normal student. But Alex allowed me to feel normal, even though I was doing assignments different from other people. Last semester here at U of E, I have attained straight A's for the first time in my life. And although I'm still in the process of deconstructing how I feel like the, my grades are a reflection of how successful I am, I am still so grateful for feeling acknowledged as a smart student. While, while exploring research regarding the correlation between inclusive education for neurodivergence, which for me specifically looks like words of affirmation, flexibility, flexibility a safe environment, and a sense of belonging, and its connections to improve academic outcomes, I encountered a lack of studies focusing precisely on this intersection, but I was able to find multiple studies on higher academic outcomes when students felt more supported. One, a study done by Susan Gerdes et al. in 2019 highlights the significance of emotional well-being in higher education, showing its impact on learning behaviors, feelings, and academic success. Two, student, uh, a study done by Naples LH and Tuck Willer, Willer ED in 2021 on young neurodivergent students highlighted that they thrive in educational environments that emphasize both their universal strengths through comprehensive instruction. And thirdly, in 2023, Espanda Shavara found that students achieved higher scores and preferred inclusive teaching methods when places of higher education implemented universal design learning, UDL. They demonstrated a strong understanding of the objectives and skills taught in the study materials. This suggests that focusing on clear goals, providing guidance, and emphasizing objectives boosts student engagement and ensures the effective implementation of UDL principles. In closing, instructors like Alex with their adaptable syllabi catering to diverse student needs foster an inclusive environment where everyone can stretch, thrive, and grow. This transformative experiment, uh, experience has shattered the narrative that I could not perform like others and excel in academic set settings. Through just one semester of inclusive education alone, I began to challenge and dismantle the educational norms I once accepted, and I am committed to forward this momentum. At U of e, I felt I have felt more welcomed, valued, and included than ever before in my educational journey. 
Alex and others like him have provided a sense of true safety within the educational space. School is now a place where my characteristics and identity don't hold me back. Instead, I am accepted, seen, and treated as a whole person with intelligence and value in the classroom. Thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I'll take them now. <laughs>